What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Talking Dogs Podcast, where you hear all the things that you probably need to hear, not necessarily that you want to hear, um, and just all my flat-out opinions about all things coon hunting, and uh, let's get into it. But before we do, please get down there and hit a like and a subscribe on the channel. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. It would help us out. It goes a long way here on the channel. Um, if you guys are just tuning in, Feel free to go check out the other content. I do make videos, not just podcasts. So if you guys are just coming in for the podcast, I do have other content on the channel. Um, but I have some subjects written out here today that I kind of wanted to talk about and get into a more long form, th uh, free thinking kind of um, pattern here with the podcast. And that's what this is for. You guys plop your earbuds in, put me in on your way to work uh, while you're running, exercising. It doesn't matter. Let's go ahead and let's talk about the first one. Let's talk about picking a puppy. And what kind of represents a good pup? Okay, so I do have a video that I go over this. It's kind of older. It's not so entertaining. So I think that I'll just go ahead and throw it in here in the podcast in the first section here. Because I think when we're just starting out and we're just picking our puppies, that it could be a daunting task. Right? Now, when I was first starting out and I was first starting to look at dogs, I heard a bunch of different guys tell me all these different things. Hey, put some coon scent on your boot and see if the puppy really likes it. Um, if they come right up to you, that's the one that you want. Uh, you know, just all different kinds of little stories or little tricks and things that they said to go ahead and do to try to pick out the best pup. Me, myself, personally, I decided against any of this. I decided to take my own judgment on this. And it, it paid off for me in the long run. Now, in the video that I made, I talk about I pick two different kinds of puppies. And I, I when I first started buying dogs, when I first started getting into starting dogs and picking up puppies and stuff like that, we would usually pick up two. And when I say we, I mean me and my brother, we, he would pick up two pups or I would pick up two pups. And we would just kind of went back and forth in that kind of way where we're picking up two dogs at a time, two puppies at a time, because the idea behind that would be get the both uh, rolling, see which one that is better and sell off the other one to kind of pay for further in on this next one or pay for taking care of these two dogs um so that was kind of the thought process behind it um which it turned out that's fine to operate that way but i don't do it that way anymore i only pick one dog and that's one that i take and that's one that i i take care uh take care and paying attention to is the one dog but let's get back on track here of the subject of picking the two kinds of pups I'll either pick the really loud mouth pup or the super loner pup these are the two pups that i pick the super loner pup being the pup that is not giving a care in the world about what you're doing about what the mama's doing about what the other puppies are doing it's out there off away from everybody else it's over there running its nose on the ground every pup a uh, litter of pups that i've ever seen they have these dogs and usually usually out of this litter there will be one puppy that will be the loner pup. It will be out there by itself, and it will be running its nose on the ground. To me, if a puppy at that age is willing to get up out of the pack, it's willing to get up away from the mom, it's not caring what's going on out here, it's too interested in what its nose is taking it to go do. For one, what that screams to me is that's a very independent dog. Uh, number two, it is a dog that doesn't need a lot of um, emotional upkeep, right? So it's a dog that you can kind of forget about, and it's not going to bother the dog. You know, we're not going to have this uh, separation anxiety or you know, whatever have you that comes along with these clingy dogs. So you have a dog that's not a clingy dog. It's an independent dog. It doesn't need help. Uh, number three, it's running its nose on the ground. Okay, so when you see a puppy running its nose on the ground and being really investigative, you can almost guarantee that that is going to carry with that dog all the way through adulthood. Right now, these puppies in particular, uh, since I have picked, you know, this kind of dog multiple multiple times i kind of understand how they develop and how they go um picking the loner pup that's off by itself doing its own thing number one they're probably going to be a very high interest level their interest level in hunting their interest level in getting things done is going to be 
extremely high and they're going to be very inquisitive and they're going to want to push track everywhere right they're going to be a very tracky dog but with this dog we're going to hit the road bump of getting it to open up and use its mouth and bark right so you're going to hit the roadblock with this particular kind of dog that at some point in time we're going to have to put a a nice big effort into getting it to open up and hammer down and you know let her rip when it comes down to the vocal barking side of things um these are the ones that are going to be waiting at the tree for you when you get there not making a peep um this kind of thing but to me this dog is the one that i prefer to pick because if you can get through and work through the uh the getting it to bark stage what we have is a dog that from day one is a very independent dog a very track minded dog uh uses its nose a lot and it's just going to carry that through ever or throughout its lifetime and once we get it to get the other half here which is the being a loud mouth when we get it to start mouthing off and barking and stuff um we're going to have a dog that is naturally kind of well put together that doesn't have a lot of holes to poke right there's not a lot of holes you can poke in that dog once you get it to actually start striking up once you actually start getting it to you know push track and once you start getting it to tree up and slam trees and stay put so we're, we're having a half of this accomplished already right and then the the dichotomy of that or the flip side of that is going to be the loud mouth dog right it's going to be the dog that is planted on the side of the kennel just letting her rip and just going to town and it, and typically out of a litter of puppies we're going to have four or five that are this way what we're going to do is we're just going to pick the the one that's letting it rip the hardest right okay so when you have four or five pups and they're all leaned up on the side and they're just going to town you know whatever um we're going to want to pick the one that is really letting loose right the one that we go, man, is that really that dog that's letting that loose? Is he really being that loud and putting that much effort um, into, uh, you know, basically treeing up or barking at the people that are coming in? Now, why I say pick this loudmouth dog is because, number one, we're never going to have a problem with, you know, getting a bark out of this dog. And when we do get a bark out of this dog, whatever he's barking at, he's going to give it everything that he's got. Where we are going to come into issues with these dogs is they're going to be really apt to tree. They're going to be really apt to tree up really fast. And you're going to get slicks. We're going to get backwards tracks pushed. We're going to get issues that arise slowly as time goes on. Uh, they'll probably start off super quick. You won't have a problem getting a bark out of, out of them. You won't have a problem running drags for them. You won't have a problem with none of this. And they might tree up and get you something treed super, super early on. And But as time goes on is when they'll kind of deteriorate off. And then we'll see the problems that we have to kind of fix out of them. But at that same time, we have a dog that will get her done quick uh, and start up quick for us and not give us many headaches in that department. But once we get rolled over into the older stages, this is where the dog is going to have holes to be punched and we're going to have to do our due diligence to get it fixed out of them. And then another thing too here, if we pick a loner dog and we pick a loudmouth dog, when we take a loudmouth dog and a loner dog and we put them together, they are complete opposites of one another. So when they come together, they work good as a team. So they're very good to get together as these two pups and work them off each other and get the two puppies started. And then one will further the other one and this one will further that one and if we hunt these this pair together for an extended period of time uh what ends up happening is you'll have a, a dog that you know is really loud mouthish it's gonna let you know where they're at all the time it's gonna stay put it's gonna uh hit the tree as hard as it possibly can hit and you got the other one that's gonna sit there and it's gonna figure out the hard tracks it's gonna push the hard tracks and it's gonna get this other one kind of pushed on through so when we have two dogs and we start two dogs together what a lot of guys tend to do is they they wait until they're super old and then they split them off and they go oh well this dog's not very that much and this dog's not very that much and then you have an issue to where you have two dogs missing different components and then you go ah well he was doing this for that one and he was doing this for this one and maybe they won't run separate so we get blocked into that so what i like to do is get them trained up just a little bit started split them off get them farthered get them to where they're kind of independent 
really doing their own thing and then we can bring them back together and let them work so we're not we're not giving the other one such a crutch okay so that's that's kind of like picking the pups in my sense and a good puppy that you want to pick um because you can pick either one of these dogs and still come up short-handed or short-changed in the genetics department to where you know some things just don't work out so you know a dog that just has focus that is that is the best thing that you can pick in a dog is a dog that's highly focused and each of these two dogs represent that the one's super focused on barking at whatever it is bound and determined to bark and bark and bark and bark and the other one is bound and determined to push its nose on the ground so focus and getting a dog to be able to focus on what you want it to focus on and not fool around too much is definitely another very good trait and that's a very good thing that you want to look for in a pub and when we're potential right so we want to talk about potential when it comes down to puppies and things like that um potential is just you seeing things in the dog that you want to see right oh i cut him and instead of burning up straight this way and taking a hard left in there and wonking up my drag, he stayed on my drag. He went there. He was there. Or we see these things to where they do the thing the correct way, and then they maybe they do it the wrong way, then they do it the correct way. And we're constantly seeing, like, you have a shining moment in there. That's potential. That's potential. And we're going to eke that out and try to carve that and, you know, cement that into the dog and – so good pups and starting pups and all those things kind of go hand in hand with all this information. Um, I hope you guys get some good information out of that. Let me know what kind of pup you guys pick down there in the comments. I would greatly, uh, greatly appreciate it. And I'm highly interested in see what other guys think and how they pick dogs. Okay, so another subject here that I got is the perfect dog. I don't really think that any one dog could ever be a perfect dog for every person right um a perfect dog is something that is very very in tune with what you want right i want to see you do this i want to see you do that i want to see you push track this way i want to see you not get skunked and figure it out i want to get to the tree and know exactly what your brain put two and two together and how you got here i want I, you know it is each person has their own mindset and their own thought process behind everything coon hunting and everything dog running and everything dog training this is just my view and my opinions and i'm just going to tell you flat out how i think it is and just give you the raw unfiltered me and that is uh, a perfect dog uh, <laughs> A perfect dog doesn't really exist. We can get super close. And when we get super close to these perfect dogs, um, it, it really puts a, a it really puts a good stain on you for a long time. And what I what I kind of mean like the, by that is it, it kind of just puts a thought in the back of your head that lingers there for forever, essentially. Man, that dog really just did something here that you know i was just flat out impressed with um because we all have a, a capacity right we all have a certain capacity of where we can think to and what we can see things of and what perspectives that we gather um and sometimes when we get a dog that operates outside of our per perspective and it shows us something and it's like huh that was spectacular that was you know genius and when we get these dogs that kind of have these moments in them and things like that, they last a long time, right? They last a long time. They stick with you for a long time. Um, a perfect dog for me is going to be a dog that is super, super focused. I don't care for a dog that is too extremely smart. If they're too smart, then they have the option of kind of being blatantly disobedient. I don't really like that trait, and that's a trait that we can get in coon hounds a lot, especially the smart ones. Um, they're just blatantly disrespectful, blatantly outright um, <laughs> uh, disobedient, um, and they know it, and they do things on purpose that they know they shouldn't be doing just to get a laugh or giggle. It's almost like they have a, a joker um, mentality where they think things are funny. And they get a kick out of doing, you know, stuff that aggravates you. Um, but that's just me. 
and that's the way that I see things. So a dog that ain't too smart, too awfully smart, a dog that's severely uh, hyper fixated on one goal, and that's train coons, a dog that is directional, right? We can direct this dog. And we don't have to do too much effort in directing the dog, right? Um, some dogs, <coughs> so let's say we cut a dog and it blows a thousand yards, and we don't want it to. We don't want it to blow a thousand yards in the woods. We we wanted it to go pick a little bit closer track and go somewhere over here. So some dogs they'll cut them in the woods and they'll blow a thousand yards. And if you zap them back or you tone them back or whatever the case may be, they come back and they're done. Ah. You, you, I don't know what you want from me now. Um, a dog that can be recalled and sent on its way again, and it knows, oh, I just, I need to do that here. He wasn't, they understand that just because this happens doesn't mean that this stops, right? Just because this happens, or I get in trouble here, or I get the little beep here, or whatever i get a holler at here <clears throat> they understand that it's because i'm doing something he don't want me to but he still wants me to tree coon so i'm gonna go do it over here and see what he thinks about that or i'm gonna do do it over here and then also a dog that is smart enough to understand when i call you back we're leaving um and just because we're getting in the truck and leaving doesn't mean that we're necessarily leaving this we're going to a different chunk or we're going to a different place to cut and if we are leaving it's your fault you know it's your fault that we're leaving the dog's fault uh you didn't do what i want you to do so we're going to go in a truck and we're going to go home having this dog that understands kind of nuances and not so much complexities but they they get a full picture of your training methods right so that would be another trait of a perfect dog. Now, when it comes down to tree and coons, a perfect dog for me, you're going to cut that dog and bam, it's going to tree. Um, that's not always the case, and you can't always expect a dog to tree immediately or tree within 10 minutes. But if I can get a dog down and it will tree coons more frequent than not under 20 minutes, you're a really good dog. I mean, you're up there. You're pretty exceptional. Even if you get on these tracks that will burn up and you take exhausting amounts of time, um, back in the day, if you didn't if you didn't hit the mark, I was I was done with you. You're you're coming out of the woods, and we're going somewhere else, and we're gonna find it again because I I don't want you whatever you're doing. I don't want you doing what that. I don't want you picking these to where it's running you all night. I want you picking these where you're getting slammed up within a couple minutes. Um, does it always happen? Is that a super high expectation? Is that unrealistic expectation? I mean, probably absolutely. But at the end of the day, um, it takes a long time. It takes a very extremely long time hunting a particular dog and washing it through a process. And you might go weeks without seeing a coon you might go days without seeing a coon you might go you know five minutes without seeing one but when we say nope you're not going to run that nope you're not running this way i want you to tree these i want you to tree these i want you to tree these tree this tree these kind i want you to tree these kind but it wants to keep training these kind then we get stuck in this wedge but if you can get a dog that can take that direction quit treeing this kind and start treeing that kind um, that, that's a, that's a really good one. You know, that's a, up there on the list. Another, uh, perfect dog in my sense is a, I want a dog to strike up. Um, I've never cared for a dog that takes a long time to strike up and I'm not even a competition hunter like that. Um, I want to cut my dog. If you don't strike within five minutes, uh, you're, you're fooling around in my opinion. Um, you better strike up within, within five minutes or sooner because, if you're taking 10 minutes to strike, there's something awfully matter with what you're doing and the tracks that you're picking. Um, because you're either, while you're out there messing around or looking for a track, you're going to catch wind of something. You're going to catch a layup. You're you're going to come across a, a older track. You're going to come across a hot track. It's the woods. They're out there. You, you should be able to find it within five minutes. That's my personal opinion. And a dog that takes longer than five minutes to strike up, in my opinion, needs work, um, or or you just ain't got the right kind, right? 
so we want I want a dog to strike up quick. Um, I'll tolerate a dog. So, so we kind of have two different mindsets in this, and that one is kind of like we're pleasure hunting. Another kind is I'm I'm training you up. You're getting better. Uh, just for my own personal preferences, not for any other reason. So we can keep you here at this level to where you're just doing what you're doing, um, and letting you get, let you kind of be at your own pace and do your own thing or we can put the pressure on them and keep them on the burner and keep them up here and keep the pressure and the heat on them and say this is what i'm looking for this is what i'm looking for this is what i'm looking for uh but you know five minutes strike within five minutes uh very crisp loud mouth um directional mouth i said this in the last podcast and i not a yodely dog I do not want a dog that yodels. I don't want a dog that screeches. I want a clear dog. I want a clear bark. Uh, you know, I want a clear voice on a dog. And that is, that's just that. If you ain't got a clear voice on you, you're already cut in my book. Um, because I, I just can't stand it. You can't understand them. You can't tell what they're doing all the time. They come in and out of being yodely and being clear mouth or being high pitch. And you get this dog that's just kind of like all over the place. I don't, I can't stand it. I don't like it. Just a very clear, very abrupt and a, a very, you know, short dog, right? When we're talking about a voice and it's hard to come by. I don't want you to hear like you're screaming your uh, vocal cords out because I don't like that. Um, I want a dog that goes, my mouth isn't overriding my you know what. Uh, I want a dog that knows my brain said do this, so I'm doing it. Not a, I'm going to do this and then think about why. Okay, so that, if that makes any sense. Um, a dog that is very clear and very communicative with its voice. Um so that's another trait of a perfect dog in my opinion another opinion that i have here is i want a dog that is gonna blow the top off a tree okay i want you to blow the absolute top off the tree i want to be able to tell so this is another very key thing for me um is when they're rolling over right so if they're chopped mouth on track and they're chopping burr, burr, burr or a dog that will sniff around and look off in a direction and go let out one big chop and then start pushing okay when we get up closer around the tree and they start thinking about rolling over you can kind of hear them doing that right sometimes what they'll do when they roll over is they'll get close up on a tree and they'll get quiet They'll, they're, they'll quiet down on the level of loudness. They're sniffing around the tree and stuff, coming off the tree, and maybe they'll come off a little bit, look back at the tree, and burp, and then get back over there, and then get up on there, let her rip out a one good locate, and then start chopping down. But what happens to me is a lot of dogs, what they'll do is they chop on track the same way that they chop on a tree, unless you give them enough time to sit there and roll it into a faster cadence chop. I want to be able to tell immediately when you're chopping on track versus when you're chopping on that tree, just by volume, right? So you should be able to increase the volume once you tree up almost effective immediately after your locate. And you don't always have to hit a locate, right? I don't, have to always have a locate out of a dog as long as I can tell when they're about to roll over, right? So when we're rolling over, that's huge. That's a huge pivotal moment. When we're getting ready to roll over into treeing uh, prior to hitting our locate, that is a good tell sign of a dog that I think is probably a good perfect dog um, because it's distinct. You can hear it. You can tell it. You know it. Um, some other things that make a perfect dog is i don't really care how fast you are like you can run 100 yards in no time flat that doesn't impress me it does not impress me man um a dog can run 400 miles an hour hit a track and be a turtle okay a dog that pushes track fast right if you can push track fast 
that's another indicator that you're a pretty good dog. Um, in there, I can break it down even farther and go into saying, okay, so a lot of dogs will push track extremely fast, almost at a full run. But what happens is they blow past tracks. They they miss turns they they miss you know circles they miss whatever the case may be they blow past them i want a dog that runs its nose as fast as it can without outrunning itself okay so if i see a dog that is constantly outrunning its nose and having to double back in and take a track a different way i don't like that i do not like seeing that what i like seeing is a dog that is moving just quick enough to where it doesn't miss a turn or it doesn't miss a trick and it is constantly keeping a steady pace and if they do blow past it maybe it's by five feet and it turns right back around gets right back in there and it starts going so sometimes they get too caught up in the oh man i'm gonna get this thing i'm gonna get this thing they'll just blow right past it they're running full bore and by the time it happens you know it almost sounds like sometimes you get these dogs that just have these million miles an hour on them is they'll run 100 yards hit a strike run a couple hundred yards hit a strike run a couple hundred yards hit a strike run a couple hundred yards hit a strike and it's almost like they're going through the woods and going i smelled a coon that's not the one i'm taking I smelled a coon, that's not the one I'm taking. I smelled a coon, that's not the one I'm taking. Instead of getting out there, picking a track, pushing the track, you know, let's pit, let's strike the track that we're going to finish the first time. Let's not strike up five tracks and then finish out the last one. Um, if that makes any sense. Um, I know it does make sense because I've seen it in the woods a hundred times. I know people know this is what goes on. It's all speculation because we're not there with them, but it's you have a pretty good idea. Okay, so another thing uh, that's going to wrap up kind of like talking about the perfect dog for me. Um, not too big, not too big of a dog. I I really can't stand a dog that's too big, okay, because a uh, dog that is big, okay, so we take a dog that is a very tall dog, a very clumbersome dog. That tells me that somewhere in its genetics, these dogs were probably big game dogs. Um, nothing wrong with that because I, I also know, because I said in the last podcast, a lot of big uh, game bred hounds tend to start late. But I also know on the flip coin of that you wait for a long time for a dog to start, but then you have a really good dog. Um, but I think what we've kind of done is we have taken these big game dogs and they're huge. They're big, right? They're big. And we've got them up here because they, and we've tried to put them over here on the coon hunting world. And we get the select few out of these that are just phenomenal. They're phenomenal at their job. Um, and with the big hugeness, people think comes, uh, comes you know, being able to run faster, all this kind of things. To me, that's a bigger feed bill. To me, that's, you know, a bigger headache leash walking. That's a bigger headache loading. That's It's just a bigger headache all around in my book to have a bigger dog. And it also tells me that somewhere in the breeding of this dog, they were either bred up from a smaller dog a coon a coon hunting uh bred coon hound and they were bred up in size to try to get more performance and speed and you know a dog that can't be kind of bullied or pushed around uh, or they have started off as a big game dog um (laughs) another thing too is color schemes on a dog i think to me there's a few different color schemes that represent and isolate certain traits and certain coon uh coon train abilities in dogs now this could just be whatever you want to say it is but uh a walker dog that's too much white in it too much brown in it to me that screams foxhound that screams um foxhound it just screams foxhound to me Uh, We all know that the Walker dogs were bred in and out of the foxhounds and stuff like that. And all of these dogs started off these foxhounds. But we get these color schemes that they look almost indistinguishable from a foxhound. Who's to say that this is not a foxhound, right? There's specific little traits and specific little things that make them different. Uh, Coonhounds different than the foxhounds. But it's the same thing with the English dogs. 
the English dogs that are mostly white, the English dogs that don't have a lot of speck in them, that are not speck like the breeding, but like specks as in color. They don't have a lot of specks on them. They don't have it. this. It just screams foxhound to me. It screams foxhound. Also, the blue Englishes that are speckled red and blue scream foxhound. Okay, that's what it screams. That's what it translates to me. Even when we get into the blue ticks, the blue ticks that look more like English dogs, they scream English to me, right? That's what it screams to me. If I'm wanting a blue tick, I don't want an English, if that makes sense. If I look at, or the Gascon, okay, so if we're talking about the, the Gascon, the blue D or whatever, the France, the blue tick bloodhound that created these dogs where we got this color scheme for and we get these Gascon looking hounds. If you have Gascon into a, a blue tick, in my personal opinion, that's not a blue tick. That is a Gascon dog, right? So there's all these little things and all these little tidbits of information, just reading and researching all these different dog breeds out throughout the years and looking at things. I don't like seeing certain physical traits on dogs certain color screams seems scream certain breedings um and different and sizes scream different breedings you know and it, it's kind of like i'm looking for an elite small compact dog maybe not so tiny um just a good medium-sized dog that's thin and you know elite that's and gonna get here done fast right and then we're also gonna i'm gonna keep breaking them down here because why not we're gonna keep going and breaking these down let's look into the black and tans right uh, a high brown black and tan no thank you it's not my opinion um high brown there's walker dogs in there somewhere that's that's what it says to me that's what it says to me black and tans with a white spot that says there's a walker dog in a wood pile somewhere <laughs> that's just what it says to me man and you can't tell me any different i'm hard-headed that way that's just my personal opinion um black and tan you better be points you know you, you you better not have high brown or high brown face that's not a black and tan because i'll just i'll just put this out there to you too um the coon hunt that i i went to the last one was the michigan state championship a couple years ago and out there uh, I went with a dude that had black and tans and we're looking around for other black and tan dogs. I found a dog that I could have swore was just a high tan, black and tan, went up, talked to the guy and he's like, this is a Catahoula dog. What sense does that make that this is a Catahoula dog, but it just looks like a high brown, black and tan. Now, I think just for me, um, if we get these dogs that are expected to look a certain color scheme, and they start coming out muddied up. They start coming out discolored. They start coming out not what they should be. Um, this just screams that somewhere in the wood pile, there's something that shouldn't have been there. And we all know about hanging papers on dogs and things like that. Okay, so I thought I was going to wrap that up a couple minutes ago, but I'm going to wrap it up now. Uh, perfect dog situation. There's different things for different breeds, and I look for different things in all different dogs. Uh, you better have long ears. Your ears better come to the end of your nose. If your ears don't come to the end of your nose, somebody hasn't been doing their breeding correctly. So, And some dogs call for it being longer than their nose, but just my personal preference, you should be able to pinch the ears in front of the nose. And if they can't do that, you're kind of you're out of there. Um, same thing for a boxy head. You better not have a boxy head. You better have a slender head on you. Um, and not so skinny that you look snipey, but, uh, you better have a, a, a slender head, more flatter kind of head. Um, not these big block head dogs. Okay. So anyways, let me just get back into, uh, the rest of the stuff here. Let's talk about the two different worlds that we have when we talk about coon hunting. Um, two different worlds. I'm just going to throw pleasure hunting and competition hunting within each of these there's different calibers and different brackets and different levels of each of these things um the pleasure hunting world pleasure hunting can mean a lot of different things and you can go all the way up to the cusp of competition hunting even you know having your own competition hunts outside of sanctioned hunts just competitions between buddies and things like that pleasure hunting to me is just a good old dog you can slap on a leash take it to the woods and it's going to treat you some coons 
all right now what you do after that that's your business you don't want to shoot them you shoot them it doesn't matter or pleasure dog you know take it out of tree possums for you a tree this the tree that uh it's just different levels of stuff and we can put as much pressure on or off that subject of you know pleasure hunting as we want to and a lot of people what they do is they'll call a dog a good pleasure hunting dog he's a good pleasure hunting dog uh you can say that because in some places that dog you're calling a pleasure hunting dog will blow the doors off of half the dogs coming into the the club uh other places it couldn't shine a candle to half the dogs coming into the club it's just kind of personal preference um calling a dog a good pleasure dog i think you know it, it can mean a lot of different things a good pleasure dog in my book is one that it's gonna tree a coon every single time um because it ain't very pleasurable hunting a dog that don't <laughs> Yeah, it's just right there a good pleasure dog i'll cut you loose you're gonna tree coon it might take you 20 it might take you five it might take you an hour it might take you four hours and you're gonna cut you loose you're gonna tree one and that's just kind of how that plays out in my book now when we're talking about the other side of things and talking about comp hunting and stuff uh my book you better be getting her done i mean you better be getting her done i don't care uh i think in my opinion my cousin booger he's been on the podcast before he told me he said son you're you want to put a a champion in the woods at level one <laughs> if that makes sense because we have these dogs they perform at all these different levels let's get up the champ they're supposed to be you know really good um that's the that's the dog that i want to start in the hunts i don't want to start a dog that that you know may do something may not do something it's gonna do a little bit of this a little bit of that no uh, if i'm gonna put a dog in the comp hunts i'm either gonna blow the absolute door off the bottom guys or i'm gonna absolutely you know made look a fool by the the big champs right <laughs> it's kind of just those two things uh, i want a dog that is high performing and i don't want anybody to come here and get the wrong idea about me because i actually at the end of the day I, i'll hunt anything i don't care i'd, I'd put a horse in the woods if it tree something uh, it just doesn't matter to me um but when we want to get nitty gritty and we want to start getting you know poking holes and things and we want to start you know breaking things down and and really applying you know logic and really a, a, applying a a crude eye to this stuff I can really get in there and start cutting some stuff up and I can really get in there and start nitpicking, right? I don't really care to do that too much because I just make myself unhappy at the end of the day because I'll nitpick something to death. Uh, <laughs> and I think, it, you know, it pays a good hand to have that ability to know enough to nitpick things and know enough to say, I can settle for that. That's fine. That's fine. But in the perfect world... We're going to nitpick it all the way down to the bone, man. Also, oh, comp hunting dogs, they ain't no different than pleasure hunting dogs. I mean, once we get up into them high-level dogs, them really high-class, them high-dollar dogs, yeah, we're, we're definitely cut from a different fabric up in that area. Um, I have, I can honestly say I have only ever been in the woods with one dog and it blew my mind how exceptionally well this dog was at doing its job and i mean exceptionally well i think i'll just say it right here it was my cousin anthony my cousin anthony has a dog i don't know if he still has it know this has been 10 years ago uh he had a female storm it was a walker dog and we took out my walker dog and his walker dog uh and we cut it that dog's feet no more than hit the ground and it slammed a, a tree and i didn't even have my dog cut yet and his dog already treed one and i went i can't I, I couldn't even believe it i guarantee you if you set a timer from the time that he clipped that dog until the time it blew the top off that tree um it was less than two minutes but here's the thing it was less than two minutes but it was about 200 yards this dog 
blew 200 yards and slammed a tree in under two minutes. And I barely had my dog cut yet. And I just went, oh, yep, this is kind of what I think. And I, at the end of the day, I don't even think he ever comp hunted that dog. Um, but I'll just say that right there. That's probably the only dog that I've ever been in the woods with that dropped my draw. And I'll never forget it. And and when you're starting off, that was back when I was younger. Um, when you're starting off, that sets a extremely high expectation for yourself, for your dogs, for, you know, tree and coons and getting things done. Um, that one will stick with me the rest of my life, dude, forever. So, Anthony, if you're watching this, I know it's probably a far shot. Anthony, if you're watching this, I'll just tell you right now, that Stormy Dog, that was hands down the most crazy experience that I've ever had in the woods as how fast and how elite that dog actually was. Now, I know that you're very hard and very strict on the dogs, but that dog in particular right there, I know why you held on to that one. Okay. So... That being said, guys, I think we're getting pretty close here to wrapping up the podcast. Please let me know if you guys like the podcast because I'm going to keep trying to push these out. Now, these solo podcast videos, they can get really draggy. They can get really dragged on. Um, and it takes a long time to sit down and cut these up and put them together and, you know, try to make things make sense. And hopefully I didn't get too far off track. I cut myself on track pretty good. I got the old list out here. I'll show you guys the list. I'll show you how good I am at list making. There you go. You can't read it. I can't read it. <laughs> That's just kind of how it goes. But thank you guys for coming into the Talking Dogs podcast. We're going to wrap this episode up. Do not forget to use promo code Melbrook5 at dogtra.com for a dogtra product, $200 or more. You get 5% off. And also, if you guys want to go get some Melbrook Studios merch, T shirts, hats, uh, hoodies, jackets, what have you, just because of my logo on them. You can go over to teasbyjoe.com and uh, I believe you can find a section there with my stuff in it. Um, shout out to everybody who has came in and showed support to the channel and showed support to me uh, and everything we do here at the channel, everything we stand for. Um, keep them treated.